everybody, St. Paul here. How are you? I hope you had a wonderful holiday week. And here we are, another episode of Music on the Run. This time featuring a dear old buddy of mine. I've known him for about 35 years. Jason Chef is coming up next on Music on the Run. Everybody, welcome to episode 28 of Music on the Run. Here we are in the basement yet again. Happy holidays. I hope you had a great, great uh, couple of weeks there. So let's just get right to it. My next guest is an old, and I emphasize <laughs> old friend of mine, musician, singer, songwriter, producer, educator, and a businessman who grew up in Southern California and spent 31 years at least as lead vocalist and bassist in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame band, Chicago. We've been friends for a mighty long time. Please welcome to the show, Jason Chef. Jason Chef. Here's you your like jingle. That? Music on the run. The music on the run. Could you make it more blue? Could, I'm With Polly the- at... <laughs> the leading chair, music on the run. <laughs> leading chair. <It's... laughs> <laughs> the lead chair. <laughs> what is that? Uh, I don't know, but uh, hey, do you mind if I give up the bass chair so you can maybe sit in on music <laughs> on the run? The best is the best is the person. Not and not that I haven't done it. It's been a long time, but the best is the guy. Actually, there comes an age where it's kind of maybe not really acceptable or appropriate anymore the guy who's kind of hanging on the side go hey man can i sit in <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know i mean if you came i came that's fine but the guy who's like nobody knows him yeah and not that it's and he could be great but it's just a funny thing where when you're 17 and 15 it's okay hey man can i sit in but all of a yeah. sudden hey man can i sit in hi jason there's our first rant. I'm yeah, an angry like, old man, yeah, right? But it's the Angry Old Man Show brought to you in part by Soy Boy Plumpy Dog. You know what? <laughs> Where you and I met in what the late '80s? Do you do you remember where we of met? Of course I do. You have of to tell the story I... because it's funnier when you talk about it. I walked into. The lobby of, I believe, was it the Fairmont in yep. San Jose? Yep. Do you know the way to San Jose? And I walked in, and this kid was singing Tony. Ba- I, I left my heart in San Francisco because we're in the Bay Area. And it was you. And I just, you know, there are times when you see somebody and you just go, I got to know this guy <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> for a long time. And I just, I was so drawn, Polly, because as as any creatives are, which, by the way, everybody's a creator. It's funny. The, the older we get, it's like everybody's creative. Everybody's talented. But, you know, True. when you see somebody like that and you're, you're yeah, you know, what was I? I was probably 27 years old or something. Yeah. And, and so you were 32. No, no, no. <laughs> You'll always be older than me. The older we get, the closer it gets, though. That's so it's kind of like, oh, they're the same. And in, in school, we would have, we would have, like in elementary school, no way, right? Yeah, I would have hated you because you were older. Actually, you would have hated me because I was younger. That's probably, probably true. No, I would have heard your talent and gone, I got to know this guy. In fact, let me turn this interview around. How old were you when you first started playing in front of people? <laughs> <laughs> we aren't going there. They already know all this crap about okay. me. I want to talk. Okay. So you and I, I was in the Steve Miller Band touring with my brothers. We're playing somewhere, I think, with ZZ Top. Yep. We're all staying at the same place. I don't think you were on. You weren't on the bill. No. You were, uh, you we had playing separate, somewhere else. We had separate venue settings, site, locations, locations. Gigs. Gigs, yeah. and, but we all came together. Come yeah. together. We came together 
at the Fairmont, and it was just fantastic. It was during the day, during the day, you know, and it's like you guys are just rocking it out, and I'm going, these guys are awesome. And that's where we met. We've been hanging out, writing songs, working out ever since. Doing Even though you don't call, stuff. you don't write, you know. You know, you got to get a little bit better about maybe checking in. My birthday was last month. Thanks for the call, by the way. Appreciate it. It went that. to spam. You got one of those phones with spam on it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's true. Oh, Jason's calling. Can I? Can I? Can <laughs> right. Spam yeah. likely. Yep. <laughs> My number has spam likely on it. Yeah, sure did. So you <laughs> grew up in Southern California and a musical family, right? Who, who, who all in your family was musical or, it, or is musical? Okay. Well, my father uh, is one of the greatest bass players that ever walked the planet. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he was Elvis Presley's bass player. He played with, he was like a, he was, he was right in that wrecking crew. Crew. Wow. And like a, you know, after Carol Kay and, and uh, Joe Osborne, They'd be calling my dad, you know, so it's right in that stable because there was so much work. Right. And he made a lot of great records. He, I didn't know this until I was about 15 years old, but he was the bass player on the, writer, on the, uh, the L.A. Woman album. I don't know what? if you know that. I don't Riders know that. Riders on the Storm, yeah. That's don't your Don't you pop. love her madly, you know? What? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And how. Oh, yeah. And how. <laughs> and the coolest thing is I've become really good friends with Robbie Krieger, so I'll play... In fact, two years ago, we, they have a golf tournament um, that I had a hole-in-one in last year. Oh. oh. Um, and I, I forgot to call you on that one. Congratulations. <laughs> well, you know. And, and so I got to play at the concert. It was the coolest thing. I got to play with Robbie Krieger and John Densmore, the drummer, who they, those guys haven't played much over the years, but I got to play Riders on the Storm, which when you think of it, the pattern, the emphasis is on a different syllable. Not it's boom ba boom ba boom boom, right? Right. So I put that little spin on it and you could it was the coolest thing to watch these guys light up like going, Yeah, you know. And it's cause, you know, my father, we've got DNA running through ourselves. Not that, you know, I will never say that I'm Anywhere near the bass player my father is. He's one of the greatest that ever lived. His note value is hmm. unbelievable, especially recording. So he, he, they split up, though, when I was really young, uh, probably around three years old. So I didn't really grow up with him. My mother okay. is, uh, has got a beautiful singing voice, very buttery. Because when you kind of try and trace it back, you know, my dad's kind of cut when he sings. He's kind of got this nasally thing, and he never really pursued it. But my mother... Beautiful voice and phrasing. When I listen to like old stuff, and I never really thought of this, but she obviously some a, a lot of the the creaminess and texture of whatever came out in my voice was from my mother, and so she had a band just like you, Polly, and I joined her band when I was fourteen. Joined the musicians union. How old were you when you joined the union? Fifteen. You beat me by a year. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I think Champlin beat us. I could have lied. Both. I know. I think Champlin beat us by a, another year. I think he was 13. That figures. But that's, again, that's like the same now that we're older. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, we all joined at the same time. You're both pretty. Girls, girls, you're both pretty. So, <laughs> so, so I started gigging with her, and I love to share this with you know kids or anybody who's coming up to find, you know, it sounds so cliche to find your passion, but yeah, find that, that northern star. It shows you, you know, Always where to go, no matter which way you're zigging and zagging, which I did a lot of as a kid and a lot of mm. us did. So, But always having that thing where those experiences showed me that everything was going to be okay, mm. that that was a magic elixir. And boy, are we headed into a, another period where that is, is the case after coming out of this um, pandemic and people mm-hmm. not able to get out consume music, play music in front of people. It's, I really believe, Polly, we were talking about this the other day, that we're, I've said this for several years, actually, when the record industry kind of started going weird, which has been a long time, that this is the new renaissance, you know? And uh, boy, 
Um, I, I'm, I'm heeding the call, as I think we all are, that people are going to be needing this uh, more than ever. You know, healing message, sound, and so. Well, that's what we're here for. That's what that's we're a long winded. So, so let me tell you more about my family. <laughs> no, I actually, but, you, you turned the corner and you kind of went forty years in advance, but I want to keep you back there. Yeah, absolutely. So what's, so what's going on in your house? You're with your mom. Do you have brothers and sisters? I do. Okay, um, are they musical? Yes, two of them are. Okay, uh, one was born later, um, and so we have a ten year difference. But Darren, my brother, who's ten months difference from me, do that math. He's ten months younger. Okay, think about that for a second. Yes, indeed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was going on in that household? Uh huh. I can't wait. Definitely <laughs> not. But what the heck? Hey, one more. What the heck? Come on. It's awesome. Though Darren's awesome, and Darren, uh, Darren, and I, you know, were and still joined at the hip. You know, we were the oh, good. kids that were basically almost kind of like twins. You know, and Darren's super musical. My oldest brother Todd, uh, he doesn't think he is, but he never really tried to pursue anything or even put his hands on instruments. Maybe it was because we just were hogging them all the time. Yeah. But uh, and then my youngest brother Lauren is very talented. Lauren's a, Lauren's talented. So in the house, though, I know him. I know him. I know you do. Yeah. So in the house, though, it was Darren and me really going at music, and my mother. She had bands, like I said, and, and there was this one time she was rehearsing in our house, and I walked in, and she said to the bass player, hey, do you mind if my son sits in the, yeah. the rehearsal? Yeah. And he's kind of like chuckling, like, <laughs> okay. And I played, and I had the gig in a few <laughs> weeks from then. And he walked, he walked out the door like, I hate that oh, little kid. Well, I don't, I don't know if, it, you know, I think a lot of it was that my mother was just happy that I was wanting to play in her band. And, sure. But that was, um, you know, that was like a, that was an amazing turning point for me because, again, it was, this, it was the first seed planted of, okay, you not only love this, but you're, you know, it's. You're good. Well, yeah. I'll let you, you have the say that. You have the talent to be, I mean, you must have known that you had. The talent yeah, to I be mean, able to yeah. do what you might yeah, need yeah, because it's it it playing those songs, you know, and lis because listening to them on the radio so much, and they're they're simple songs. I mean, they have to be played right and played well, but it was not hard to not hard to pick them up. So yeah, so that was, and I've also shared that, um, you know, don't always rely on what's easy because the bass felt like it played itself. Now I played every other instrument. Not like you, but I played, you know, four, not 40 other instruments like you. <laughs> but I played, I played a little, I, I got a guitar. I started on piano around six, seven, you know, we had a piano in the house. And I was picking songs out on it. And that felt pretty natural. And then I got a guitar, when I, a cheap guitar with strings about that far off the neck. Oh, oh. You know, electric too. Yeah, that was oh. nice. Nice sustain. And, uh. Ouch, man. And and then Darren had a drum set, and so we had we had those instruments around. And so I was goofing around with them, and I was actually playing bass on my guitar before I got my first bass. Oh. And it's funny in my first band, well, first band with my buddies when I was in sixth grade, I'd play. I've heard a lot of guys, a lot of bass players did this, but they started playing bass parts on the upper strings of a guitar, and. I just remembered as I was playing that, I remembered, I know that I'm playing bass. I'm, I'm, this is a guitar, but I can just feel that I know I'm playing a bass, hmm. you know, as far as the, the, um, the function of it. So that was what was going on. My mom, shortly after that, a very pivotal thing happened where she got a gig in Twin Falls, Idaho, which meant she was going on the road. Right. And so she she was so excited and just smiling like we're going on the road and I'm going unbelievable. And that was in November, so the school year had just started. I was in I was in 8th grade. And one of her good friends, a piano player, said, "You can't take him out of school, Linda." 
And she said, okay. And I came home and she goes, I have bad news. You're not going to be able to come with us. And I was just heartbroken, oh, but I got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. She gets up to the gig and the club owner says, where's the fourth guy? And she goes, well, that's my son. He's 14. And bless this guy's heart, man. He just, I guess he th thought he saw the novelty in it. And he goes, well, I paid for four band members. So he puts me on a plane. I'd never flown before. My parent, my, my mother and grandmother who both, you know, we were living at my grandmother's house, petrified of flying. It was just, oh, just oh, oh. no, these people did not fly, but I got on a plane. I was the first one in the family and it felt so awesome. Paul, the first flight and I was on my own. I flew up there and I played this gig and it changed my life because I knew that this was my home, that this was what I was going to be doing. And, and like you said, I was good at it. Right. I remembered some dude came up to me and asked how old I was. And he said, man, when you're 18, no one's going to be able to touch you with you. It's not quite right. But what a great thing to hear. For you know? Sure. I know you, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know no, you're, but you're a, a real, you're a real wonder kid. So, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, don't, you're hurting my ego right now by yeah, telling I'm, you, me I know. about you. You've always been that fragile. Oh yeah, I'm pretty fragile. Oh, that's so great. So I've known you for all these years and I've never heard that story before. Yeah. Crazy. That's how it started. And She's still around. She's in Nashville, so I get to oh, see her. Oh, that's great. Yeah. In when fact, did I just... You, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I just started writing a lyric. By the time this comes out, we'll get into this, too, that there's a new exercise that I've gotten myself into musically, but um, this is okay to say this because then it really kind of puts the fire on me to finish it before it comes yeah, out. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I started writing a lyric about her and all this. It's funny, we'd be talking about it right now, hmm. but because I've never really written a song about her and that. She's 84, super oh. healthy. So, I mean, you know, it's not like I'm sitting here freaking, but I mean, listen, as uh, we all know, this temporary thing, man, hmm. you know, get on with it. You're, you're very lucky to still have your mom. You really I know. Are. You really I are. knew yours. Yep. Oh boy, did you ever? That's, That's not, not your a key, good key is it? for you. <laughs> maybe we should. Uh, maybe in one of the little extras, we'll put in Jason and Mom jam together Would you in please, my old house. Please do it. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Oh, she loved you too, man. I mean, we we hung pretty darn hard. Okay, so getting back because otherwise it's going to be an eighteen-hour interview, which wouldn't be a bad thing. How do you go from playing with your mom at fourteen to getting into Keen? Okay, I remember being in my grandmother's living room watching television, and I saw these, okay, here I go on eight, in eight different directions, but I, I was this 14-year-old kid, right, and I was starting to make some noise, and a lot of it was that the guys that I was running with in my community, we grew up in a beach community, so... A lot of these guys were just playing surf music, which was popular. I was not in popular bands, you know, because I was starting to go off into Earth, Wind, and Fire and Weather Report, and and you know that was not cool music to the masses, you know, in in junior right. high school, in high right. school. So I was uh, I was I was watching TV one day, and these kids came on television. It was either Mike Douglas or Dinah Shore or something, and I saw the Keen Brothers. And I thought I was pretty hot stuff until I saw that. Me too. I saw them too. Yeah. Anyway, that, let, yeah, please. No, let's talk about you for a while. <laughs> See I'm how he here, did that, I'm just, people? I'm just here to interrupt you. See how he did that, people? You and me, were the um, same. We both liked the Keen brothers. Yeah, well, it was a great thing to happen, too, because it, it right-sized me, which was a good thing to happen at that age, that I went, whoa. These guys are light years beyond me. This is world-class artistry, recording, everything. Yeah. So I remember telling my mother, and it was so weird when you say these things, that you, when you don't really fully believe them, but you're putting seeds out there, you're planting seeds, that I said to her, if I could ever meet those kids, I know we'd make great music together. Thinking, that's never going to happen. Well, the next thing I know, when I'm in L.A., a 
a buddy of mine, Peter Atanasoff, who's a beautiful guy, great guitar player, who also introduced me to Buzzy Featon, which really started launching a lot of great stuff in around 1983, 82, 3 ish so i get to la and and i'm with peter atanasoff and peter said you got to meet my friends the keen brothers and i went you're right i uh-huh. do i said you know them he goes yeah they're my good buddies he introduced us and we took off like a rocket man we were fast friends darren too darren and john we're like thick as thieves. John Kane and me and Tom were thick as thieves. In fact, so they had they had just broken away from their their child star kind of thing. And yeah. Tom was 16. John was 14, turning 15, I think, when I first met them. And Tom was just so advanced because he had he had secured himself a a record deal that he was producing for Japan. And it was basically starting to get away from his whole structure, you know, of of what he had going before, which basically was his father, which is an amazing story. Bob Kane produced Richie Valens and Bobby Fuller Mm -hmm. Four and Delphi Records is Bob Kane. So, and I understood that. I resonated with that, that at a certain point you want to get away from, you know, mommy and daddy and they're, you know, under the, even though that it was a great up, you know, upbringing and education in music. I remember when I told my mom when I was 16 and I joined a band called Coco Blue and Sandy, you're not my manager anymore, my manager, right? And uh, You're fired, what mom. That, what does that mean? But I was just breaking, breaking free. And so that was Tom, too. He was 16. And they had a bass player from the Bay Area named Mike Millwood, great bass player. And I remember just salivating, going, man, I wish I could be in that band. And sure enough, the the next record came around, and Mike wasn't able to come down or something. And they said, okay, you can do it. We went into Sound City. Sound City, you know, the movie that's out, and everybody's like, Mm -hmm. I'll never forget. John and I were reminiscing about this the other day, that we were in Sound City cutting that record, and REO Speedwagon was was in one of the rooms cutting High Infidelity, like Keep On Loving You, that record. We were there as they were making this stuff. Rick Springfield was in cutting one of his, he was he was on fire yeah. at the time. In fact, I remembered there was a there was a video game that I beat the high record and I'm so proud of the fact that the next day I heard Rick came in. They go, "Rick's all pissed off somebody beat his record." And I go, "Yeah! <laughs> I beat Rick Springfield, man." <laughs> oh, you beat Jesse's girl. You did. I beat Jesse's I got Jesse's girl from him. Right. So that's how that happened and um I'll tell you another, another real quick sort of uh, amazing thing of how all these things tied together is that Tom introduced me to David Foster, who David, you know, that it was pretty insignificant. This is just one of Tom's buddies, and it's Jerry Chef's son. Right. And that, right. that intrigued David. Any of the, the greats up here, you know, know my father. And so they're like, Jay Graydon, same thing. Wow, man. You know, so yeah. all these heavy, heavy dudes, you know, Jeff Procaro, all these guys that knew of my dad. And so David just knew me as that, as, as you know, Tom's buddy and, and you know, I'm Jerry Chef. Whoa. Oops. You okay? You okay over there? I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's you've perfect. Got editing, <laughs> you've got editing capabilities, don't you? No, that's staying in, baby. Oh, good. I yeah, hope so. That's staying in. This is, uh, uh, this is live TV, baby. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So... So uh, Tom would call me and say things like, hey, man, want to go down to Davlin Foster's producing the tubes? I'm going, okay. Yeah. So here we go down to Davlin Recording Studios, and I just walk in as Tom's little buddy, just a fly on the wall, right? I'm like petrified to say a word. And we walked in, and there's David cutting guitars for Wild Women of Wongo on that tubes record and just and hearing that and there's humberto and i'm like whoa next thing i know man tom calls me another couple months later goes hey man want to go down to davlin foster's producing chicago and i go yeah so i walk in with tom and again i'm just so you know aware and wanting to not be 
noticed or in anybody's face. Yeah. They were cutting drums on Hard to Say I'm Sorry. Oh. And I watched, talk about like your life sort of unfolding and you have no idea where things are going. Again, David knows nothing about me yeah. Uh, yeah. musically or whatever. And I remembered Robert Lamb walking in. He had like a green sweatsuit on and he, you know, didn't even notice me because I was, like I said, out of the way. I remembered Marvin, uh, Marvin Gaye's sexual healing was, was peaking on the charts at the time. And Foster walks in and goes, Marvin's back in a big way, man. And they were all like, you know, they were all huddled up, excited, you know, cutting their yeah. tune. And so I leave. Next thing I know, a year later, eight months later, whatever, I'm driving over Laurel Canyon, going from the west side into the valley. I'll never forget this. And as I just get over to the crest of the, of the hill, hard to say I'm sorry comes on the radio, and I hear it for the first time. And it was the heavens parting. As you remember, it was like, yeah. it, like a seminal moment in pop music. It was like, oh, my God. This is... It's like hearing every breath you take. This is like the most phenomenal thing. And I was there when they were cutting drums. I didn't hear the song. They were just right. cutting drums. Mm -hmm. And when I think of it, I would have thought, okay, between that time and when I actually joined the band, it had to have been five years. It was like two years later. Is that it? Crazy. I mean, that is, that is, it all happened that is, so fast. It's destiny or density. Density, <laughs> but Tom and John Keen. Not that that really got me to that to that gig. I mean, they were David was intrigued. Yeah, and there's an interesting story what happened on day one of the vocals, which I'd love to share at at some point if you'd like to hear it. But of and Champlin Champlin knew me, but he knew me as a bass player. I was playing in a guy named Carmen Grillo, who was playing guitar for Tower Power for a while. Great yeah. singer, guitar player like a mini Champlin. He's from the Bay Area. These guys were really tight. And I was playing bass in Carmen's band. Okay. And literally probably six months, about six, seven months, like dig this. So we're playing in Carmen's band and he's got Bill Champlin playing B3. He's got Leslie Smith singing background vocals, Tamara Champlin singing background vocals. And I think one other background vocalist. And all of a sudden, um, Tamara came up to me because she had just heard a, she had come into a studio recording session date uh, a, a week or two earlier and heard my voice. And just, so she comes up to me and goes, you ought to get a tape to Bill, Jason. You never know. And I'm going, yeah, I should, shouldn't I? <laughs> of course, never followed up on him. Like, going, yep. I'm not going to get that. And then I remember the day Bill walks in and says, Satara has just left the band. And that, that, no, that's the day. That's, that's why she'd say get a tape to him, right? Ah, uh, got it. And, and, and so I didn't think anything of it, but the way it happened in a roundabout way, like eight months later, you know, like you said, you know, density. Yeah. Density, but. Well, take, you might as well take us all the way there. Take us okay. eight months later into the future. Okay. I want to hear so, about how you got the call, what the audition was like, the whole mess. Okay. So I, I, um, in 1984, I took a gig. I took a club gig. Actually, it was at the Enlisted Men's Club, which was a big open-air club on, Ho on uh, Oahu at oh, cool. Pearl Harbor at their, at, at their uh, the Enlisted Men's Club. And the reason I did it is I wanted to get out of, out of L.A. because my, my cocaine habit was just out of control, right? Oh. Yeah, so there you have it. Well, there you have it. So I thought I got to get out of got to get out of LA. And so I took this gig and I stayed away from stayed away from the blow. Okay. Know. Yeah, the smoked blow a little is... weed here and there, you know, okay. Hawaii. It's legal right. in California now, so I do know that. Um, but at any rate, so but it it gave me a pause to really reflect on where my life was. And all I could think of was I got to start trying to go to the next level. I don't know what that is, but let me see once I get back to L.A. Again, Paulie, you know, we can play top 40 music till the cows come home. I don't even have to really work that hard at it. But that was, 
I thought that might be kind of, you're not challenging yourself, you know? And again, I was not really singing. If you came in to see these top 40 bands, you would not say, this guy's going places. I mean, you know, yeah. I really don't believe that. And so when I came back to LA, I said, I got to stop playing top 40. Let me go after a publishing deal. Like my buddy, Aaron Zygman, who I grew up in San Diego with, who'd come up to LA and drilled it. You probably know of him, the Jets. I do, and, I do. Right. That's why I know of him. Yes. Yeah. Junior high school, me and Aaron. One of my first sessions, he'd hire me and then got to LA and the Keen brothers, he'd hire us. But I went to, um, so I, I came back to LA and I started writing with Dennis McCoskey, who one day we were over riding and I introduced him to Bill. Dennis wrote a, some really big hits and now has been in Nashville and has written a ton of, ton of hits out there. Um, Dennis gets a phone call from a guy named Ronnie Vance, great publisher. Mm -hmm. I know of him. Yeah. So Ronnie says, what are you doing? He goes, I'm, I'm sitting here writing with Jason Chef and Ronnie goes, put him on the phone because he'd been hearing about me. And Ronnie said, what are you doing? And I said, yeah, I'm just writing something. He goes, come on in and have, let's have a meeting. I told him, you know, I, I got a couple cuts. David Lastly, you know, great background vocalist, but also great lead vocalist, had, you know, had a deal on Geffen. I said, so he goes, come on in here. So we sit down and I tell him, yeah, here's what's going on. And he goes, so who's got the publishing? And I said, well, Bobby Caldwell's manager is going to help me. And he goes, Jason. Stop giving your publishing away. He goes, here's how it works. He goes, if you have some stuff in the pipeline, I can go to my partner, Kathleen, Kathleen Carey, who it was her company, and I can show her this. Here's this guy, and this is what he's got going. Then we can actually start putting a deal together. But if you keep giving it away, I said, okay. And then he did something that was the coolest thing. And this is, this is old school. He tested me. He goes, why do you want a publishing deal? And I said, I want a publishing deal so I can go into the studio and record anytime I want without having to depend on my friends who've got deals. Because this is before the gear, Polly. This is 1984-ish. 85. Mm -hmm. 80, no, it was 85. That's right. So this is how, how fast everything happened. And he said... I said, I want to be able to go in and play all the instruments if I want. So I want to be like Paul Peterson, even though we hadn't met yet. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stupid joke. Hey, I well. want to be able to play everything, you know, if I want. And, and he goes, you want to go record? I'll tell you what, I'll give you a couple of days over at MCA Whitney and no strings attached. I won't even take the publishing, but you can go in there and record. So I'm going, okay. So I called some buddies and I go, so, yeah, I've got these couple of dates, and I remembered somebody saying, oh, yeah, that's that old gospel studio. So I'm thinking, funky, yeah. you know, it doesn't really matter. I'm not taking it seriously. And, in, in fact, let me just interject here that there was no game plan. The, best, the most game plan that there was was being in Hawaii, trying to get off of the, off of the hod stuff and yeah. say, I got it. And, and thinking that it was probably staying in top 40 bands, which it wasn't. It was just an addict you know coming to terms with all this and so i so i wasn't taking it seriously and the night before i went in i borrowed aaron aaron's dx7 and his sequential circuits drum machine you know and right. i programmed up do that do that that's it that's mm -hmm. as elaborate as the hi-hat pattern was i smoked a doobie and I started trying to write a ballad, and it was pathetic. Mm -hmm. you know, just completely squandering this, this, you know, at this point, this opportunity. So I get up the next day. I pack these little pieces in my car, and I go, and I walk into MCA Whitney. And, yeah, it was, it was an older studio, but it was Neve Studer. Yep. It was an 80-series Neve console and a Studer machine. I went... The, I, I can't remember this guy's name. He goes, hi, I'm your engineer. And I'm going, I better come up with something fast. So I, I thought, what do I have? What do I have? And I said, that tune that I started with Bobby Caldwell, Heart of Mine, is not done yet. We've only got a verse written, 
but I'm going to cut it. So I do that. I recorded Heart of Mine and just sang the first verse a couple of times. Called Bobby. I called Bobby Caldwell, calling, calling Bobby Caldwell. And I didn't know what the protocol was. I didn't know if he was going to be mad at me that I didn't ask him, right? Right. So I call him and I said, I hope you're not upset, man, but I, I went in and I cut heart of mine. And he just goes, really? Do you like it? And I go, well, yeah, yeah. And he goes, come over here, play it for me. So I went over to Bobby's house. He heard it and he flipped out. And he said, this is awesome. He goes, we're going to finish the lyric tonight. Dennis Mitkoski co-wrote it with us. And he said, we're going to get on the phone with, with Dennis and, and finish this lyric tonight. I'm going to go in tomorrow to cut your, to produce your vocal. And I said, awesome. So we finished the lyric. It took us like two years to write the song because we were just, again, we were, we were getting distracted, yeah. filling the blanks. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And, and we finished this, and I walk in and meet Kathleen Carey. And Ronnie's, I think, when I think back on this, I think this is the way it was set up. I'm going to go in and meet his partner, and this is an introduction, you know, to getting to know you. Mm-hmm. So I walk in, and he says, so I meet her, and it was really great, great vibe. And I, he goes, so did you get anything? Kind of with a smirk, kind of thinking, you could just tell. He didn't think I had anything. And I go, yeah. Not super confident, you know, and he goes, he goes, really? Do you like it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, give me it, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. He puts it in the tape player, the tape player. Yeah, all right. Paul, this is that moment, and I'd love to hear whether it's on this podcast or something else. You're welcome to share yours. I'd love to hear it. I, I would love it to be in this podcast. But this was that moment where this tape was being played and Kathleen closed her eyes and I watched her take in music more deeply than I'd ever seen anybody. Just every morsel of it. And the song ended and she opened her eyes and looked over at Ronnie and said, we've got to sign him immediately. And Ronnie goes, wait a minute, don't you want to go on your vacation that she was going to? She goes, no, 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 no. Get a lawyer. And we're signing him immediately. Based on that one song of... That was a hell really of a song. Not, it is a hell of a song. Though. Well, thank you. I, it I, is. You, you know, Woo. I appreciate it, man. And, and so that, continuing on with that, I get this publishing deal. I'm still kind of dabbling with the bad stuff. Yeah. And, but, you know, kind of starting to think I got to get it together here. I'm actually rising into a more professional position, but everybody else was nuts too back then. This is 84, right? I, and, oh, I, I, I remember being nuts in 84. Do you know anybody you read about it on the internet? No, no, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. So, so I had three songs in my catalog and Warner brothers calls Kathleen and says, it was Michael Austin calls her and says, do you have any songs for Peter Cetera's solo album and or somebody to write with him? And she goes, well, we just signed this new kid. Let me send you his stuff. So she sent my three songs over and his assistant called the next day and said, who's singing on these demos? And they said, the writer, Jason is. And I go, okay, thank you. Hangs the phone up. I get a phone call from Kathleen saying, something's going on. I don't know what it is, but I can feel it. I've been doing this a long time. Get ready. And I'm going, for what? She goes, I don't know, but something's going on. During that week, Paul, that demo of Heart of Mine and a song called Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now that Buzzy and I wrote that ended up on Chicago 18, the first album I did, that tape circulated to the entire structure of that band and industry. Warner Brothers, David Foster, Chicago, HK Management, and all of a sudden, a week later, I get a phone call saying, we think that you're the new lead vocalist. Can you come and audition? From 
Want to go down Foster's cutting drums on, on, right? This is two and a half years later, man. And I'm going, it's funny. I get this question so much of like, how did you have the confidence? I said, there was no way that it was confidence. It was like, this is probably not going to work. I mean, I don't think anybody <laughs> thought it was going to, right. truthfully, I don't think anybody thought it was going to work. I think the record company was probably hoping Peter would go out and do his solo stuff and that, you know, he'd take a break and they'd come back and he'd do Chicago 19. But it was, I went and auditioned the first time and I was, of course, super nervous. It was Danny Serafin's home studio. So okay. we were, just, my, my vocals were coming out of like monitors that were in the other side of the room. Not that that's even an excuse. I mean, I just, on that level, I was not ready to step in and, and front front this group, you know, live. If we went out and played a, a show the, the next day, who knows what would have happened. But they were going in to cut the record. Right. And next thing I found out, sorry, David, I got to tell this story because it's awesome. And I've thanked them about this, that next thing I found out, Foster heard our demos because we went in and cut demos once I got the gig, they made me audition twice, by the way, which is, was totally fair. I mean, yep. and then all of a sudden just saw that you had the gig and, and people always said, man, you, you've made it. And I go, no, no, you just got an opportunity. I mean, it was like, there's a lot to have to get through here. But that was and, it. You had two auditions you were in and then you were like, now what? You're cutting a record. Well, yeah. So we had some time that we had, we were going to get our demos. Robert and I wrote a little bit. I think Bill and I maybe wrote something and Jimmy and I wrote something. And I, uh, we, we finished those demos. And I remember saying to Robert, I should probably go in and redo some of these lead vocals. Cause I was kind of sick and not feeling great. And I made a mistake that I'll never make again. And I love sharing this to up and comers too. He looked at me and said, don't worry about it, man. It's not to show him the, the vocals. It's to show him the songs. Well, you've proven yourself. This is replacing Peter Cetera. Yep. Uh, coming off of Chicago 17. Hard habit to break. You're the inspiration. Hard to say I'm sorry. Pounding the radio. Yeah. They yeah. went and took the American Music Awards for, for Group of the Year. And this is David's first listen at who's he's got to work with and mm -hmm. what happened was we had cut a great song called niagara falls that bobby caldwell and steve kipner wrote and of course bobby's vocal was just ridiculous right david hires him and brings him into the studio gets him on the mic and of course it's just mind blown and corners him and says you got to bail me out man he goes they made a mistake they, they didn't oh. get the guy. And Bobby goes, well, you got to know this is really uncomfortable for me. He's, Jason's one of my best friends, man. Sure. And okay. David goes, well, I don't, I'm not saying to fire him. <laughs> you know, just you got to come in and sing the hits, which that would have been completely, I would have loved that. In fact, I thought that might have been what my original role was because Mickey Thomas was being talked to about it and, and, mm. and uh, uh, Richard Page. And if they would have just let me come in to play bass and maybe sing a song or so, that's really what I felt ready for. But man, to the day I die, I, die, I take a bullet for these guys, and particularly Robert Lamb, because um, Foster called him, called all of them, and Danny really stepped up. You know, they said he said, "Man, you guys made a mistake." You you know, and they said, "Sorry, you're working with him. He's our guy." Wow! Right? Really? Now, if I didn't deliver. I mean, they were being fair enough to give me a shot, but that's really who these guys, these, that's who, how they've always been. It's like mm. really, you know, really wanting things to work out and fair to, you know, coming into this thing. So, so I, I went to the studio on day one and we cut Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now. Luckily I knew the song, it was mine, you know? Right. And it was the weirdest thing because David had some songwriting um, some songwriting class or, you know, something going on. He had all these writers from Canada. And I walked in the room 
and I knew that he he was he wasn't really sure of me, and I didn't blame him. Again, I've thanked him for this. He always gets squirrely. No, no, it was great. And I said, "Come on, man, this is a fun story. It yeah. was a you know sink or swim." And he introduces me, and he's like, "This is the new lead singer of Chicago," and I'm like, "This is kind of weird because I know that he's really not buying me, right. but he's I'm being he's being forced to work with me." And so he says to he says to them, "Okay, you guys, go, got to get out of the studio. We got we got to get some work done." So they leave, and the door stays open. You know, at least the you know the studio door stays open. But David looks at me, and there's David Foster and Humberto Gatik on the other side of the glass. And David looks at me and he says, kind of really sort of sheepish, you want to try one? And I go, <laughs> and I go, yeah. And I swear, Paul, I'm sitting there thinking, this is probably my, probably my one and done. Been nice, you know, I've gotten this far, and so, you know, but I'm really not ready. And man, the headphone mix that Humberto had. Yeah. And having David Foster and that track feeling like it was, it was as perfect of a, of a scenario as you could ask for. And I took a breath, took a deep breath. She was lost, uncertain, and heard my voice, and it blossomed from there. I, f I just felt comfortable. Yeah. And man, most of, the f most of that track on, on Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now is that first pass. By the end of the take, Every one of those songwriters had filed back in and they were all like just, and it was this moment and Foster had his head in his hands and we finished the take and David looks up and he goes, you just blew my mind, but then you knew you would. <laughs> and we, and dude, we Ooh. sailed through that record. Really? I, I, I've heard what an ogre this guy is, how brutal he is with singers, but yeah, I had yeah. Bill Champlin and Robert Lamb's standing next to me, mainly Bill. Uh, you know, I've, I love sharing this too, that that's the standard. You know how many chances you had back then? <laughs> One. Yeah. None of this, I got to get ready. No. Bill Champlin walked to the microphone and first take, drilling it, and you better go follow that, man. And so we started a, just a, a relationship and a family and a body of work that, when I think back now, it just blows my mind that I always felt like the guy who kind of came in late in the game, but the numbers are there, man. Our numbers are, you know, half of the 80s success of that band, man, was during that period. 31 years, is that right? Is that how long you were there? Is that A little over 30 years until, okay. you know, and now you know, you know the story that my, that I had some illnesses in my family and- yep. I got to, again, I thank these guys up and down that they totally understood and gave me the gracious opportunity to come and be with my family, man. So, yeah. But, yeah, 30, so just over 30 years. We like to say 30 plus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 30, but, but, 30 plus. But not 31. Yeah. What was the most important thing about being in Chicago for you? The most important thing, what a great question, is realizing the service work that it is. And like we were saying earlier, that that is, that is going to be the focus coming back out when people are, are ready to get out and take music in. Is that, I'll give you an example of it. On September 12th, 2001, the day after, we played yeah. in Puyallup, Washington at the Washington State Fair. Washington State Fair, and uh, and the the lady who runs the venue, we'd play there two or three times before that, and it's always this great vibe. You remember, like you'd meet these people every year and see them. So, hey, great to have you back. But man, the day after, there was this bizarre feeling, of course, where everybody's shell shocked. But we stayed out there and played. We kept, we stayed out there. We didn't come home, and. I watched an audience that was in so much pain. And when we sang, when we performed uh, Feeling Stronger Every Day, yeah. which I sang for the first time, I never was delusional, which is funny because people would say, you've been in the band longer than Peter Cetera. I go, so what does that mean? It's like, 
You know, he's the man. He's the gold standard. You know, he's, we're standing on his shoulders. I appreciate that, but, you know, so I was never delusional thinking these are my songs, you know. Um, they're his songs. You know, I, I'm, I'm a part of this. And as Robert has always said, Chicago is an experiment. It's a beautiful experiment that will survive, just like any body of the greatest classical music works, you know, will survive long after all of us are gone, you know. And, True. And so tw- um, feeling stronger every day, I felt a connection to that song because of what was happening when they were listening to those words. They're going, now I know what my place in is in this, that I'm, deliver- I'm the messenger. Mm. So and so looking at that, Paul, and and then all of a sudden realizing that what a trip. I'm just a I'm just a top forty musician, like I said, that was it was very natural to do that. But then I joined a band and, and was able to create some top forty music, you know. So True. and and I see the I see the I see the cods and letters, you know, of people yeah. we got married to Will You Still Love Me and yeah. What Kind of Man Would I Be is our is our anniversary song and Look away is, you know, and it's just unbelievable of what you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You've, you've done the same thing that the, the work that we've done and the good that it does, it's great uh, to have, I've also said that it it's is. great to have, it's great to have lasted long enough to get over yourself, you know, which, <laughs> which, which really didn't take long. Cause these guys were such seasoned vet, veterans that, you know, they wouldn't have allowed any kind of, you know, egoed out rambunctiousness. And that's True. not really where I was coming from anyway. Right. But I just slotted in real easy because I was not worried about trying to be known for my artistry. And I just, I love great songs. And so yeah. I'll, I'll sing you them had, the way they're supposed to be sung. And, and you had that's a lot the best of great part. songs to sing, didn't you? Oh, the luckiest. Again, it's like unbelievable. You know, what a, what a beautiful thing to have fallen into. Then, we, then you and I, while you're touring this whole time, we're still in touch. We're still yep. hanging. You'd come through Minneapolis. You and I would go to Paisley Park with someone like Rick Barron or something, write some songs, and uh, you ended up putting one of the songs that we wrote that week at Paisley, uh, I think, on your Japanese record, didn't you? I did, yeah. That's one of I'm my waiting. favorite songs. I, I love that song. Somewhere in Between Somewhere Us. Somewhere in Between yeah. Us, yeah. Yeah, Rick, that lyric. It's a great lyric. So, and you then, know what's fun? What? No, what? What's fun? I was going to say, you know what's funny? I've just reconnected with Steve Percaro. Oh, cool. And, and he mentioned that song. Did he really? It makes it changes sense. changes in that. Because it's so eerie. It's so up his alley, yeah. right? Yeah, it's true. You know what I'm he saying? Was- so it's like, it's funny because, oops. This is going to be in your podcast. It's high tech. <laughs> I'm not changing a thing. I love it. it. No, I'm keeping it. it the same. Ske- What's keeping it the same mean? <laughs> is that a new word? Keeping it? Keeping it the same. Oh, s- you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is uh, nothing gets by Mr. Chef. That's for sure. Oh, and, I, and you. Butter, I'm coming up. Yeah, I would rip you apart if I if yeah. you let one fly there. But you're, uh, you're we actually. Used to- Tris and I used to, Tris and I used to have the best time out there doing that. It's like if one guy made one little tiny mistake, we'd pounce on each other. And, there's, <laughs> and there's, that's, then all this. That's part of the fun stuff of being on the road. What was your favorite part about being on the road, man? Let's switch gears and, and, and go in that direction. Besides the playing, the obvious, the audience, the performing. What you know was what's cool funny? For you? you know what's funny, man? I, you know, since I came home to take care of the family and really just make sure that I'm not gone that much, Mm -hmm. I've done a few different little things like that Beatles tour with Todd Rundgren and Christopher Cross and and, uh, Mickey Dolenz and and your boy, Joey Molland. That's right. Yeah. Minnesota boy now. Minnesota. Um, Kind of getting out. And walking into a hotel, I love the I love the I love the quiet time. I love the I love the the quiet time where when you know when we're home, there's there's so much 
to do and there's so many distractions that are that are important Mm -hmm. you know we need to get things done but when you have that pocket of time where you're going to go out and you're going to work there i just kind of dabbling in it since you know 2016 has reminded me that i love that i love and it's funny because you know, I got a new band uh, with Jay DeMarcus of Rascal Flats and Dean Castronovo, who played with Journey for 18 years, incredible singer in bad English. Yeah. And so we're going to do some dates next year. And, you know, I just started thinking about, you know, when I go out and do these personal appearances of how much I love those little pockets of time. and. I've been reading some stuff lately, not to go too weird and deep and heavy, but, Good you know, how humans evolved and what was going on. And, and in, this makes sense, man, that we're really designed to be searching and discovering. You know what I'm saying? There's a nomadic thing about human beings. You know, once we all, they all settled down and, you know, a lot, of, lot changed, you know. A lot of good, but there's a there's a an inquisitive thing about just getting out there and exploring. That's the word, exploring. Yeah. And so I'm realizing now that that and Lamb was always like this. Just, I, he, I love he'd use the word wanderlust, and it just makes sense. It's not running from anything. It's it's important. You go out and things happen, and then you come home, and you know you've deflate and and uh decompress and and it's uh that i love about it that's all yeah i forgot that you'd be going on for a while longer okay um <laughs> well of course the music no 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 but, uh, no but i'll tell you I'm, that's a great question because that that's really what it is the last time i think i walked into a hotel and realized i was only going to be Actually, we were, we did a couple of um, charity things out in Nashville with our band, Days and Deans and, and Chris Rodriguez, your boy, mm-hmm. and Tom Yankton. The band's called The Rise Above, and we've cut a record album. Right. It's really cool. We have a great team. It's basically Rascal Flatts engineer, Derek Basin, who also makes every, um, has made every Luke Bryan, Carrie Underwood record. Wow. He's, He's up to about 78 number one singles at this point. But boy, what this guy does with your voice, Polly. Yeah. And you know what's cool? When mm. we get in and we start recording, and he's he's probably he's the generation right after me. So he's probably in his early 50s. He grew up on all this stuff. Loves hearing the stories of the great old engineers and Humberto and all that stuff. But right. boy, this guy is just phenomenal. And uh, so there is that good enough of a tangent to go off? Of? <laughs> That's a good. <laughs> Didn't mean I anything. Wanna, I want to bring it back to you and me when you were coming in through Minneapolis. You came on to my to my house and was at my kitchen counter, and you went, "Polly, I got this thing that I think you're going to be really interested in." I'm like, "Okay, what is this now?" <laughs> what is Jeff doing now? Right. It's like, no, really, I think we should do this together. It's called P90X. Like, P what? P90X, man. Come on. We're going to get in shape. We're going to drop a bunch of weight. We're going to get ripped. And I'm like, really? We are? <laughs> we're gonna, <laughs> and we're going to inspire people, and we're going to inspire our bandmates, and we're going to inspire our fans to get in, in better shape. And I was like, and you have the unbelievable ability to talk people into anything. I will say that. However, what you do talk people into are usually really good ideas. You and I had such camaraderie during that stretch of, had to be eight, eight years or something like that, working out, being accountable to each other. We're both on the road. I was with Loggins or Osmond, and you're with Chicago. We'd call each other on the phone like, Did you do it? How many rounds of P90X did you get in? So that for me, and I wanted to mention that because this is what this podcast is about. It's 
called Music on the Run. Get to talk to people like you about what it's like to survive 30 plus years on the road and then some. And that involves how do you keep peace of mind? How do you keep your body together? How do you keep your relationships together? How do you raise your family together? And this eight year stretch for me uh, was so important and so life changing. And, you know, the dedication that you and I had and that we spread throughout our yep. community was so beautiful, man. Not only were we not cocktailing, uh, we were inspiring other people to maybe not partake as much and or if they were, to work it out the next day. Yeah. And just by not preaching, but just by doing and them come yeah. out and go, I want to do that with you because they were seeing the result. And I tried to get Tony Horton on here to come and kick our butts because I haven't done a round of P90X in a really long time. But what a pivotal time, not only in physical health, but in your and my relationship, our hang. That was such a beautiful time. Do you, what are some of your memories of, of, of that time? Because you really went quite far with that corporation, too. I did. I, I saw that, you know, music, the business was changing so much. We just finished Chicago 30. And, you know, the... Uh, it was it was obvious that things had changed and records weren't selling like they were. And so I got the bright idea that I told Tony, who's a good friend of mine, as you mentioned, Horton and I have known each other before either of us had anything going. And he sure didn't look like that when I first met him. He was this little spindly guy. But um, I told him, I said, I got an idea. I want to write the music to your next product but I have a, an angle. I don't want to get paid for it. I want to do it for free, but I want to get involved in your world because they had, they had message boards. And if you remember, that was the mm -hmm. whole thing. Yeah. And the CEO just loved it. I mean, he just goes, wow. He goes, I'm, yeah. I'm just so blown away. I totally understand why you're doing this. I go, yeah, yeah. And how funny thing is, is that I wrote for two products and every seven years it comes up to renew the license, man, you know? So it's like, hello, right? So it's like, it was a cool thing to do, but it really, it, I mainly did it for the accountability. I said, I'm putting it out there. Cause I was, as you know, man, I've battled my weight my entire life and, and, um, you know, up and down yo-yo Horton's funny lines. That's like, I said, I have a board before and after picture. He goes, another set. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. <laughs> another one. <laughs> <laughs> I go, and so, but you know, you got to keep trying, man. I mean, you just can't say, yeah, well, I do. messed up and I'm a piece of crap and I failed and I'm not perfect. And so I should go all the way down the tubes. Yeah. No. Um, but that was the, that was the, that was the thinking was I said, I'm going to announce to the fan base that I'm going to get in shape. I was probably 40 pounds overweight, you know? Mm. And, and they were just horrified, you know, like, cause I think it, and you gotta be careful. It's cause it's, if you get preachy, it's like pointing a spotlight. Well, you need to too, right? Everybody. Yep. yep. And at, at that age, 45 years old, when this started happening, you know, I just said to Tony, I go, I've got back problems. My fingers are tingling, but every other 45 year old guy that I know is saying the same thing, that's just what happens. Right. He goes, no, it, it isn't. And sure enough, P90X cured the back, pro back problem with uh, yoga, plain and simple, right? Mm. But that was the reason was to throw myself in and make, make a public commitment. And it was amazing, man, because it was, you know, for a guy who has really won it most of his life, you know, these were like seeds being planted for um, not only commitment, but organization and finally starting to kind of think about a game plan. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, fortunately some nice things happened. And again, it was, uh, you know, I joined something that was, that was firing on all cylinders and got to become one of those cylinders. And so there was never any, I'd never even thought about like, what's it going to take to keep this all going. And it, you know, 
Lamb was really into f- health and fitness, so we yeah. all yeah. ran together. And right, and um, fortunately, you know, I took some vocal training leading up to that. That obviously, um, you know, was a big part of you know. So again, I wasn't thinking about it, but get it get it done before get the reps in. I always tell people get the reps in before the opportunity comes because. Then without even thinking about it, you'll have, as Seth Riggs said, you'll have a technique that'll last, and he's right, you know? Uh, so um, the P90X thing was, and by the way, I just went through a round. I got into the final phase, and I had two weeks to go, went back to Nashville, and the sciatica started up again, man. I think, oh. I think, I, I think I've, I overtrained. So, my really? wife and I've been, yeah, yeah. My wife and I've been talking about this. Even Tony says, like Tony, a lot of products that have come out, they're like twenty-five minute workouts, twenty-minute workouts. Mm-hmm. So I'm letting this rest. Yep. And it was such a drag because I was on fire, man, just super strong. I, you know, had some pounds to lose and still do, but, but just getting back into it, Paul. And I thought, I thought of all the stuff like you're saying. It's, it's in us now, it's in us. And and by the way. You're very inspiring with the runs, with the with the the jogs and and all that stuff. I love that you put it out there. I do because I think it's good for people to see you out practicing what you preach. It I'm is. Like, I'm like, hey, I'm not the fastest. I'm certainly not the best runner, but you don't. Who cares? I'm no, I'm out here. I'm out here having fun. And there's the thing for me with running is it my brain. My brain gets to like, right, deflate for one second, so yes. I don't have to be yeah, da, 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 twenty four <laughs> seven. And you know how I might have nearly as much energy as you. It's damn close. Da, 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 da. We go, 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 go until we sleep. So I get up and I'm on at five thirty six in the morning until I pass out at ten thirty. But in the meantime. I get a lot of stuff done. I'm healthy because I take my runs. I am inspired because I do deflate my little brain to get out of my own way. Yeah. And hopefully that brings some sort of uh, inspiration to people out here in the fan base. That's why I do it. But you, you and my brother Billy before you was such a huge contributor to me staying in shape, speed skating all that stuff, and then P90X coming out, trying to get ripped before I turned 50, which I did. Yeah, you sure did. And then learning to love to run, and that was Kenny Loggins' fault. I think it's cool that we can pass that on through our fan bases, that it's cool to do that. And it helps your creativity, too. I love to run, too, man, and I'm just wondering if maybe my knees, I've just, my knees are really starting, but I, I got some I got some weight to lose too. And I know that's not good on the knees, but I love to run. And I've, I've been running during this last round of P90X. Okay. I got a great, I like, you know what I like to do? I don't care about um, like speed or, or that kind of distance type of stuff. I love inclines, man. Oh, I, hate I love inclines. I love inclines. No. I love to run up inclines where you're barely even moving. It's so steep. <laughs> No. You talk about, you know what's funny about it? Because it's almost like mountain biking. I don't know if you've ever gotten really heavily into that, but. No, not really. Mountain biking or even cycling in general, you cannot blow it all out. You got to find the cadence. And mm-hmm. then talk about a meditative, like what you get with running, man. Mm-hmm. It's the best thing because you're, you're basically taking your body and your heart to a place where it's right in the zone. If you're going past it, yeah. You're not going to get, be able to keep going. So I, I've got some, I got a really hilly uh, run that I go do. It's only like two hills, but they're, they're, you know, it's not like up and down and up and down, but that run is about an hour and 20 minutes, you know? Ooh. So I don't know what that is mileage wise, but, but you're not, you know, hoofing like the whole time because it's, it's not flat, that, but I miss plenty. it. You're, you're in, insp- oh, I know you're inspiring me, man, because, but I got to, it's like the sciatica, and then there's a weird groin thing. Because you know what it was? It was the legs workout in P90X. I went oh, to, no. I went to, and I know I remembered when I was doing like the side lunges 
Oh yeah. You know, with, with some weights and, 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 uh, you know, bouncing up quick. I remember thinking this feels good. This feels okay. But I remember this is how I hurt myself the last time. And so sure enough, man. Uh, so don't overtrain. Don't overtrain, but, but do some sort of physical activity. Absolutely. I think well, it the helps other th- creativity for sure. Well, when you were talking about that, it, it made me think of two things, really achieving two things at least. One is getting the endorphins going and the heart, you know, moving and just that whole, basically it's a, it's a high, right? Yeah, it is. Yep. The other thing is, and when you say it just gets you out of your head, I call that, it's putting a pause in the day, whether it's a meditation. That is meditation though. Running yeah, is. is meditation. It's true. But it's putting a pause in the day. You got to have some type of a pause. That's the whole, mm. you know, and I, I meditate, you know, I got some cool apps, you know, guided meditation and stuff. And it's beautiful. Send it's them a, please. Would you? Okay. I don't know if I could sit still long enough to enjoy them, but we'll try. Boy, it's, you'd be surprised because uh, when they're guided too, it's really cool because there's something going on. So it's not just like, okay, here's start out at 10 minutes. But here's 20 minutes of just sitting there with nothing. But, but it's that Yeah, we need to pause. Yeah, we do. So a pause just, for the cause. Just because we, we're working on about an hour and 10 here, I want you to give a little advice. You raised a family on while you were on the road. You successfully raised a family while you were on the road. You kept your marriage together. What do you think is the most important thing you can tell the next generation of musicians about successfully navigating life on the road? Well, first of all, you have to have the right partner. And for me, I do. Um, my wife is fiercely independent. um, But you just know that, you know, we need each other without being needy, but you have to have the right partner. If somebody's freaking out that you're coming and going, good luck. I mean, I, and you know, it's, you got a great one too, man. I mean, yeah. come wife, on. You, you named her wifey about wifey. 20 years ago, and I still call her that to this day. <laughs> yeah, well, you guys had a little pendant made. so I you No, oh. you bought it for her. Oh, okay. You did yeah. at the Minnesota okay. State Fair. Anyways, I digress. Go ahead. Anyway, Go ahead. so you got to find the right person for starters. And then I, that's like 99% of it. Because you can't be going out there. Like my son, JJ, he's 22 and he's signed to, uh, he doesn't really talk about it, so I probably shouldn't, but he's, he's an Interscope artist. Oh, wow. Sorry, JJ. Sorry, JJ, I'm going to out yeah, you. Yeah, that's great. But he's, he's so cool. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about it. He's never really gone out, you know, and said, hey, congratulations to me or, you know. But he's, um, you know, he's, he's just getting his life going and, and we've had some really great talks, and his mom has of like that. You really need to make sure that you are not involving yourself in a way that's gonna that's gonna create that friction while you're out of while you're out of town. He's 22 years old, so if you find the one, although it's, he's so sweet, he says, "I really want what you have, yeah. family." I said, "Awesome," but just for right now, during this cycle of your life and career, if you can, you know. If it happens, it happens, but don't go running after trying to find something because you got to find the right one. Otherwise, it's, you know, and I've, we both know, you and I both know a lot of people out there that we've toured with that have incredible marriages that have lasted forever. And that's the way it is. They just have to have to be um, independent. And, you know, again, that's, that's really why I was, you know, was able to come home was through the loss. You know, once my, my wife lost her father and her mom was sick you know um i saw the first little little crack in the armor Mm. that and i went when her mother goes i'm not going to have her fending for her she's been a dutiful soldier all these years yep and so that was you know that's when I went and talked to management and the guys and, and told them. Wow. And they, like I said, they totally, totally got, how can't you? It's like, you know, this is what we're going through. 
And then, uh, and then, as you know, we lost a, a boy, you know, her, her yes. son and my stepson that yeah. I raised from four years old. And I'll just tell you this, man, I'm so glad I was, you know, six, eight feet away from her when she was delivered that news rather than 6,000 miles away. So it's all right. worked out right. so well because I got to experience all these things that we'd want to do as an artist and a musician, but then be so lucky to be able to have the opportunity to, and I was thinking, okay, this is really a horrible. Everyone's going to go through it. I mean, you lost your mom. It's just mm -hmm. not fun. And no, and, and you go through these, these losses and these profound things that you go through. And I'm going, okay, so I get it. Father passed mother's, you know, terminal with cancer. And so let's figure out when it's going to be the best time to go and deal with that. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to come home and, and be the, you know, here I come to save the day, right? Yeah. Little did I know, man, that it's like, then the real heaviness started. You know, like I said, a couple of years later, we lost a child. And it's like, but again, I'm so glad I'm here for that rather than being away. And that's just luck, man, because yeah. from what we've done, man, with these, these bands and artists, you know, um, not everybody gets the chance to to do it all. So you're you're right, and and your timing with leaving to go take care of your family seemed to me just almost perfect timing. And the fact that it was an amicable thing, and the fellas understood, and the fact that you had the wherewithal to make that incredibly difficult decision. Or maybe it wasn't a difficult decision. Yeah. Uh, knowing you, I mean, you were like, I'm out. I'm going to go take care of my family. Well, it's like we've all been through so much together. I've been through the loss of, you know, my, my bandmates, parents, and I don't sure. think, you know, kids yet or anything like that. Hopefully never. But, well, Champlin lost a son. Um, but that's... That's not a hard thing. Do you like this blue thing that as, as we've been talking the whole... It just <laughs> kind of changed your whole vibe in there. I tell yeah. you, hold on a second. Let me... <laughs> blue moon. What a weird thing. We start talking about this, and then all of a sudden the, the, so, yeah, the I was room like, gets, hmm, That's wow. my hue lighting system. I love but, it. you know, yeah, it's a weird thing when you're going, this is your life, man, and, and you're a lifer, and you've... You, you, you're a big part of this family and thing. And that's what was so beautiful about sitting down and, and telling them about it. They, they completely, how can't you? I mean, yeah. how can't, how can, well, and again, it's not like we're in the middle of making hit records, right? It's not like we're coming off of Chicago 17 or 18 and going, you know, um, I got, listen, all the heavy lifting's been done. We've made all our hit records, you know, and so now right. it's like it's just a beautiful thing to be able to continue to to spread this music. But when when life is hitting you, yeah, that just that's a that's a testament to the to where these guys are at, man. They're just they and it's a testament to where you are at. Hearts. to recognize. Well, but family is so incredibly important. So to these young people who are out there. So you, it's the partner, pick the right partner to be successful. And what? Listen to your heart, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny, Paul, is that people, I see this a lot with younger people that they really think they have to have it all designed and figured out and plotted and planned. And, and I think that there's something lost in the simplicity of how we came up that if you love music, play it, find other people that love to play it. If you're good, they'll find other good people to play it with and they'll want to play with you. And then if you want to keep taking it further, go, you know, put yourself in the right positions to do that and try your hardest to choose wisely with who you, especially if you get married, who you're going to spend the rest of their rest of your life with i mean and that's just that's that's a stroke of luck too because you yeah you, know, you can you can at least you never know right but right but it's uh but don't worry about it so much 
you know, because so much of it's in its fate and in God's hands, whatever you want to, you know, say it. It's the truth, though, because like my story, you know, I'm a guy who just was a natural bass player. And I just put myself into a position to have to work a little harder at something, and that was vocals. And luckily, the the opportunity came that I was very comfortable in, you know. But you can't plan that out and design it. Do your best, you know. I mean, I lost some, you know, I lost some auditions that broke my heart. I, I almost got the gig with Shaka Khan a couple of years before that, and that was perfect for me. I'm going, man. And I was close. Yeah. Almost got the gig with Oingo Boingo. Right. Um, I almost, not almost, but you'll appreciate this because this is so similar to your world. But I went and auditioned for the Crusaders at 17. Wow, and they, I didn't know They that. dug me, but I just didn't really have the solo chops. I didn't read, right? Oh, right. But they stayed in touch with me and had me back when I was 19 to audition again. And still I was not, I was getting more into the, to the singing thing. But uh, yeah, Paulie, it's, um, just don't worry about it so much. You know, put the, get the reps in, try and find a great uh, partner. Um, or not, you know, don't worry about that just yet. You know, just be straight. Your partner is your art for a while. Can be. be. You know, for a while, it's like dedicate yourself to that. And then, you know, trust that the right things are coming, going to come along. And, um, you know, one of my favorite questions is when a parent will say, what can I do to motivate my kid to play? And I go, no one had to motivate me. It's true, isn't it? No, yeah. yeah. And they, you play and then because you, start, you want to. And then you start thinking about it. And this is, see, this is where it's gotten, you know, with the whole parents grooming their kids to become superstars. And it's like, I get it. You may be looking at the next Jocko Pastorius or Tiger Woods, that level of talent, and they may not want it. So who's, is it up to you to say that's something that is squandered? According to you. Yeah. You know, it's but a, it, it's a fine line as a parent of how, how much do you push your kid? Because kids are naturally, not, well, they can be, uh, not necessarily into practicing or whatever the case may be. And I remember with my own children, you know, taking piano lessons, going, you know, we got to go over this. This isn't just going to happen. You know, we, we, we have to go over this. I mean, look, I didn't like to practice when I was taken from the nuns either. I'd be in there playing Stevie Wonder. So I was like, how do we figure this out? And you find your, your way, you muddle through and you, you do actually figure out what that balance is. It's different for everybody. Jay DeMarcus, world. Jay DeMarcus has told me, his dad, who just passed away, bless his heart, Wayno. Um, Wayno was the type of father, really talented keyboard player, singer, played left-handed bass on a Fender Rhodes bass. Yeah, baby. And Columbus, Ohio, just a rock star in the clubs. And he made his kid dig for it, man. He made him dig for it. Although mm. he'd sit him down and he'd teach him some stuff, but he didn't sit there pounding away at him and it motivated Jay to keep working. And then his dad, when he wouldn't get it right, his dad was not tossing roses to him. He goes, that ain't it. Yeah. You know, um, uh, my sons, Connor is 19. He's a bass playing drumming freak. Talent. Really? Yeah. But I never tell him to practice, never tell him to mm. do anything. And for a while, he was, he was six, seven years old, seven years old, I think, when we were in L.A. before we moved to Nashville. And he went to one of those rock schools. It was School of Rock at first, and it turned into Rock Nation. And so J.J. was there, and he was playing drums. And I got Connor his first little bass, <laughs> little tiny bass. And he shows up with his little suspenders on, trying to have a little rock look. And Tracy says to them, can my son Connor, you know, well, you know, they usually don't let him, you know, play bass in these bands till they're about like 10 or 11 because they can't even really hold the, the strings down. She goes, well, okay. Well, can you just hang out for the day? And she goes, sure. He was in three bands at the end of the day. He's that good. 
He's got Jerry Chef innate pocket and feel. It's like the kid's feel is unbelievable. Don't Just sell natural. yourself short. He's got yours too, then. Well, I appreciate that, but it sounds better when you, you know. Of course it does, but it's But you true. know what? You know what? He he got lit with the drums at a certain point. And I've told him this story. It was not as natural as the bass. It was not like when JJ and, and Connor would play in their bands when they were 10 and seven years old, it was otherworldly. It was like that Van Halen thing of like this brother, like you guys, mm. you guys play together. And it's, I'm sure when you were kids, it wasn't a baby band. It was like some, some yeah. world-class stuff going like the Keen brothers. So Connor and JJ have that. And then all of a sudden JJ didn't want to hang out with his brother and he wanted his buddy like in his school and his like, you know, fourth grade, fifth grade friend. So he, he kicked Connor out, which Connor didn't care. He was like, you know, he's just, he's a go video game. And JJ started playing with this bass player and it turned into a baby band. It was just like, okay, it was silly. You know, it's like, okay, JJ didn't even sound as good as he does because the bass player was just a kid, right? The uh, minute yeah. he started playing with his brother again, <laughs> I mean, they'd play yeah. Gravity. Really? Um, uh, Mayor at that yeah. tempo and just deep funk, man, pocket like that. Ooh. And so Connor started playing drums. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, but he wasn't touching the bass. And. And after about a year, maybe two years, it started bothering me. And I almost said to him, you know, why don't you pick that bass up again, man? You know, because you're really natural with that. But I didn't say anything to him. He was playing, though. So this is a difference of, like, somebody who's not practicing. But he was not, he was not exploring what I felt his natural gift was. But he was listening to a lot of Jeff Procaro, and one day I pulled up in the car and I heard his right foot, and I went, "Wow, yeah, it finally happened." And then he and, I, and then his and his sixteenth note hi hat, single single hand hi hat, sixteenth note, and I just said to him, "Now you've become the kind of drummer that I love playing with, man." And he's phenomenal, and I I loved sharing that story because I didn't mess with it. He started playing bass again. He plays them both, and he's phenomenal. But, but rather than getting in his, I just let him find it. So I'm with you. You know, I think I think maybe a happy medium might be to talk to a kid and go, "Do you want me to encourage you and push you, or do you want to?" I don't know. It's a good con. Maybe we have another. We have another uh, podcast on how round to, how table to, with this. It's good. We we should because I think that's important. Parents don't know how how hard to push their kids, especially yeah. if they're not musicians. Absolutely. Yeah. My friend. I love this, you. I, I miss you. We haven't had a chance to catch up. This is our catch up. Uh, let's try to be a little bit better about catching up. Don't <laughs> we need to practice our piano you know, lessons yeah, a little more. We do. We need a little more, more encouragement to, uh, to keep in touch. That's it's, it's so good, and it feels like yesterday that we were hanging out, and uh, I love you. I love all the stuff you're doing. It, uh, the memories that I have of you and me hanging out over the last 30-plus years, man, just brings the a best. smile to my face. Really, really. And uh, oh. love to your family. Um, I can't wait to see you and play with you in person again. I'm going to get you on the Funk the Friday one of these times if I could ever give up the, the bass chair. The bass chair. Look, you're just hogging it all. I now have. I'm playing bass. Now I'm playing p guitar. I'm playing some <laughs> keyboard. So listen, oh, guess what? You see the drum thing I did? I'm so talented. <laughs> uh, I love you, brother. Have a have a great um, what? Have a great New Year's. That's what it's going to be. Yeah, and we'll see you on the other side of COVID. Is there more than one that's coming up? More than one. New Year? Year's? Did New I, Year's? Did, did I say no? And with that, we're out. We'll see you in two weeks with the next episode of Music on the Run. Ow! We're gone! Music on the Run was hosted by yours truly, St. Paul Peterson. Edited and produced by my buddy, Davide Razo. Video editing by Ivan Sebastianov. 
And a very special thanks to the people who financially support this podcast. And remember, when I think about the girls who've touched my life.